And okay, everyone, we're going to get started with the biochemistry workshop with uh, Dr. Narin. So Dr. Narin, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Okay, so we're going to start off with questions uh, from myself, as well as my partner. We work together to create these questions. Then we got some pre-submitted questions as well from a form we sent out earlier. And then lastly, if the audience has any questions, they can feel free to either add it in the chat or unmute their mic afterwards. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so for the first question, lots of us are new to the field of biochemistry and some of us haven't really heard about it that much. Could you kind of explain to us what biochemistry is and what about it makes it so interesting? Definitely. So, I mean, as the name implies, biochemistry involves the study of either the chemistry of biological processes or the biological context of chemical processes. So one of the things that first sort of drew me to biochemistry in the first place is um, the very intricate nature of everything. Obviously, there are very, very complex pathways that are going on, um, everything that makes our bodies work and make the environment work um, that involve very, very complex, very detailed um, pathways and processes. That's one of the things that uh, drew me to it is it's so very detail oriented. Um, I happen to be a very detail oriented person and that sort of drew me in. Um, when I was very young, much younger than I am now, I thought I was going to be a physician and be some great surgeon. Um, and as I learned more about it, I realized that medicine is really wonderful, but there are also many other ways to study um, things that have medical applications. Yeah, so that's actually a really good way to get into the field of biochemistry. I hope a lot of you guys took that down. If you're all detailed people, then biochemistry might be the field for you guys. So another question that we had was, what does your average day of work look like? Ooh, um, so the job that I'm currently at is we're at a startup company. So we're in the Bay Area, there's a lot of startup companies. I will not say that I have very many typical days. A lot of things kind of pop up and um, things are unexpected, which is one of the things that's exciting about it. Uh, but the majority of my week, let's say, I do spend a lot of the time at my bench. So I'm doing experiments, I'm preparing different solutions, I'm preparing different um, samples, be it DNA or protein or cell cultures, and I'm actually running experiments. But on the flip side of that, of course, you also have to take time to analyze any results that you get from those experiments. And then once you uh, finish analyzing your results, then you have discussions on the experiments that you plan to do next. So it's a bit of a cycle like that. Um, in my particular, particular role at a startup, I'm also doing a lot of other things. So I'm training other people. I'm coordinating with other groups to kind of consult on projects that they have going on. Um, we're also working a little bit with our commercial team. Um, so we're working on getting units out to customers as well as sort of doing our own R&D internally. Yeah, so that's really cool. Uh, a lot of our students today actually were just doing experiments a little bit earlier. So could you kind of get into like what kind of experiments you do? Sure. Um, so in my current role, the company I work for is called Genapsis. Um, and we make, the product that we make is a DNA sequencing instrument. Um, so we have a product and we've developed it um, with a team of very, very talented engineers, some chemists, some biologists, some physicists, um, some biochemists like myself. And so a lot of the experiments that I'm doing are to make sure that our system performs very well. So we know that it um, can generate sequencing data for a particular sample. Um, a couple of the types of projects that I've been working on have been how can I make the sequencing reaction happen faster? How can I increase the accuracy? So a lot of this involves um, changes to sample preparation, different ways that you can um, improve that process, different ways that you can change the conditions of the sequencing reaction that's actually happening on our instrument. Um, so that involves a lot of different um, conditions, a lot of different chemical reagents, a lot of um, biological optimization. And so that's where a lot of my background sort of um, plays into it. So the experiments themselves range depending on the question that I'm trying to answer. So if the question is how fast can I make the system, um, what, what can I do to generate the data more quickly while still maintaining accuracy? Um, one of my recent projects has also been 
improving the overall workflow. So we have an existing platform that we currently sell to customers, but um, just like any other company, we're constantly trying to make that better. So we're trying to make it a little bit cheaper for the customers. We're trying to make things a little bit faster. We're trying to increase the amount of data that you can generate given a, a single sequencing run. Um, so there are a lot of different questions floating around in the air. So the specific types of experiments that I do kind of center around uh, which types of questions that I'm trying to answer. Yeah, that's awesome. So uh, you said that you, that you have a lot of like different problems that you need to create solutions uh, for. Do you use like any specific tools for each problem or is there just like a general set of tools which you would use to solve every single problem you get? Um, so I will say at its very foundation, um, one of the biggest tools that I honestly learn or that I honestly use most often is the way that I think about problems. And this is unique to everyone because everyone's background is a little bit different. Everyone thinks about science and problems and the world a little bit differently. Um, so one of the, the most advantageous thing I think is the perspective that you carry. So my team is four main people and then we've got a couple other people we work with fairly closely. One thing that I really appreciate about my team in particular is that everyone has a slightly different training, a slightly different background. So one of my very, very close colleagues is a pure physicist. So she has a very different perspective on things than I do. Uh, we also have an electrochemist. We also have an electrical engineer. Um, so when the four of us sit down and talk about the same problem, the, the biggest advantage that each of us has is that we see different aspects of the same problem. Um, so the physicist might be more focused on um, some of the dynamics of the reaction that is happening. I might be more focused on the biological efficiency of some of the enzymes or some of the different processes that are happening on our instrument. Um, the electrical engineer might be focused on um, signal detection and our electrochemist might be focused on the best way to actually maximize the, the phase that we're reading. Um, and so a lot of these are very, very technical, very specific things, but truly to address your questions about tools, I, it, it has to be our minds. It has to be the way that we think about things. Um, obviously being well-funded and having a lot of technology uh, physically in the lab, that helps because it's less stuff that you have to do by hand. Um, but really at its core, you don't necessarily need fancy equipment. You just have to be able to think broadly about a certain problem. Yeah, that's really cool. So you also mentioned that you work in groups. Uh, are there any characteristics of a group mate which you think are really important, especially in the lab? Um, I would say being adaptable. Um, and I think this really carries outside of the lab as well, because everyone, again, everyone has their own perspective perspective for a certain problem. I'm sure a lot of you guys have done group projects, right? Um, it's not always easy to work with everybody because everybody does have different ideas. So being adaptable, being flexible, um, being open to hearing other people's um, opinions and questions and having an open mind to think about things in a different way than you maybe would otherwise, I think is very important. Um, I think it definitely also helps to have sort of a, a team player attitude. It makes everything go a little more smoothly if you know that everyone's goal is the same. Um, and truly, I think that no matter what you're doing, being excited about it helps. Nobody is gonna be excited about doing something if you don't actually want to do it. So having the motivation, finding something interesting about the topic, even if maybe it's your not, not your most favorite thing, finding at least one thing that's very exciting about it will definitely help make it easier for you to think about it. It'll probably help um, help your attitude towards the situation a little bit as well. All right, awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to where you said every single day is kind of different for you. So there's not really a, a like a casual work day. Uh, do you re recall any like kind of favorite moment or any moment that was like really out of the ordinary in your work? Like any day that something random happened? Um, so one of the very cool things for us, um, as I mentioned, we are a startup company. And so sometime late last year, we did our first commercial launch, which means for the first time we offered our product to be um, sold for real money to someone out in the world rather than just us doing our own experiments. Um, and in order to get there, it took years and years of development, a lot of optimization. Um, one of the things that I was pretty involved in was we took 
our instruments and we went to outside labs. So these are people who don't use our product every single day, don't know all the ins and outs and all the jerry-rigged things that we do to make things work. Um, and we were able to take a bunch of our systems, install them in other people's labs, teach them how to use them, and then help walk them through processing their results. Um, and as soon as we started doing that and we realized that other people were starting to get um, similar results to what we saw internally, so they had very high quality sequencing data, um, their, uh, their samples were easily separated, that was a very cool moment because it showed us that, okay, we, the people who developed this know how to use it, but we can also teach it to other people. And then if you think one step beyond that is that, okay, if we can teach this to other people, then other people can use our technology and use it to their advantage. So they can use it to solve the problems that they're looking at um, in all sorts of different types of research. So that was a very cool turning point for us. Okay, yeah, that's really nice too. Uh, I'm gonna take it back a lot, uh, a long time ago. Uh, so, wait, let me get this question. Right. So um, a lot of people know like fields such as doctors or surgeons have a very like structural path from high school to their original profession, whether it's like pre-med, then med, and then going to residency and all of that. For a biochemist, is there like a certain path that you have to take or is there like a very different way to get there? Um, there are probably a couple paths that are more traditional, but there's, I mean, there's definitely many, many ways that you can wind up in the fields of biochemistry. Um, so I, what did I do? After I graduated high school, I, at the time, I actually thought that I wanted to be a physician. I thought I was going to go to med school, um, take all the pre-prescribed sort of steps that you um, took, in part because that was something that I knew, right? People know what med school is. You, you go through all the steps. We've all seen the TV shows. Um, and so I went to college. My major was biochemistry and chemistry. Um, at the time, my university didn't necessarily have a pre-med major. Um, it was just kind of a checklist of all the classes that you have to take to make sure you're eligible for med school. Um, so I took those, it was pretty standard within my curriculum. Um, and when I got to my, I think it was junior year, whenever you start applying for uh, postgraduate schools, I applied to medical schools. I took the MCAT, I did all the things you're supposed to do. Um, and as I was doing this process of applying, I was also talking to, um, a few people through different connections who were actually students in med school. And the more I talked to them, the more I realized that maybe med school was not the only thing that I could do or wanted to do. And so what I ended up doing was I took, I didn't, end, obviously, I didn't end up going to medical school. Um, I actually took a year off after I graduated. I worked um, actually at a lab at Kraft Foods, which is not strictly biochemistry, but still actually technically is. Um, I worked there while I was talking with um, different graduate schools and applying to different graduate programs, because what I realized was I wanted to be focused on um, many different types of research rather than purely just going into a clinical setting. Um, so for me, I went to graduate school. Um, I was in the chemistry department. The lab that I ended up joining had a focus on biochemistry and biophysics. Um, again, nothing is, is purely one bucket. I think you'll find a lot of things sort of overlap and collaborate together, which is also really nice for me. Um, and I went to grad school for my PhD. Um, another option would have been that I could have gone for my master's and then also gone to work somewhere in the industry. Um, I chose a PhD program, again, because I wanted to be focused on research. Um, I, I like writing, so I got to write up several different papers um, that got published in a couple of different journals. So it was a very cool way, a way for me to, um, to learn more science, definitely, but also to um, develop my, we'll say chemical intuition or the way that I think about um, specific problems. Um, and a lot of the times the specific research that you pick or that you end up doing in your graduate program it's not always exactly the same as what you'll find in, um, in your job. For me, this specific system that I studied in grad school, I'm not working on that system now. Um, but what I really carry with me is a lot of the fundamental knowledge. So there's a lot of uh, basic um, biochemistry knowledge that applies to a lot of different systems. And then on top of that is really how you think about a problem and how to go about a scientific question and 
not only come up with possible ways to um, address it and to answer it, but to also sort of carry those out. All right, awesome. That's actually a really cool path to get into where you are. That's like, I never even thought about it that way. All right, yeah. so uh, after, so, so besides the education part, which um, you've like went from after high school to where you are now, are there any habits from college where you, like educational habits where you still see uh, yourself doing in your current profession? Habits, um, working really hard, I think. Um, in, I enjoyed high school. I will not say I was the hardest working person in my high school. I did well in school, I did fine in school, but a lot of my time in high school was spent doing extracurricular activities as well. So I had my classwork, I had like peer activities, I was in the school choir, I was in the dance company. So I did a lot of stuff and I enjoyed high school, but I didn't enjoy high school because of the school part of it as much. Um, so when I went to college, and as you find that you're, um, you're advancing in your education, things get sort of more and more focused, um, things become narrower and narrower. And I think because of that, and because things became more and more interesting to me, I started to work harder because I had to keep up. Um, and that's definitely something that I carry with me now. Um, some of it is intuition, but a lot of it is definitely you have to be dedicated, you have to be excited enough about it to want to work really hard about it. Okay, awesome. And that brings us into our last personal question, and then we'll get on to pre-submitted and the ones from the audience. So a lot of people attending today uh, are really ambitious. You can kind of tell because it's the start of winter break, but they're all here learning something new. Mm -hmm. uh, what opportunities could you re uh, recommend to them so that they can kind of get a feel for what biochemistry is, whether it's a club, an organization, anything? Um, so I would definitely say if you're lucky enough to go to a school that has, I don't know, science clubs, STEM clubs, um, even just single events similar to this, um, step one would be to take advantage of those, which you are obviously all already doing. Um, if opportunities like that aren't necessarily available to you, um, I would say start with your networking. I know that a lot of you are very young, so you think networking is just talking to your friends, right? But think about your friends' friends or your family's friends. Maybe your friend's cousin is in grad school for some type of science that interests you. Maybe you could talk to them about that. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be something that you already know about. Um, Honestly, it might not be something that you already know about, but getting exposure to different things and, and realizing different paths that are out there. Uh, like, um, like you said, a lot of us, we know what med school is, we know that path. A lot of us aren't familiar with anything else. Um, so you could graduate high school and go get a master's. You could graduate high school and go get a PhD. You could work for a while and then decide that you are in the mindset to go back to school. Um, so there are many, many different paths that will wind you up wherever you want to go. You just kind of have to be looking for them and talking to people who are already doing it or who might know someone who's already doing it. Um, that will definitely be an advantage for you. Okay, awesome. So that wraps it up for my personal questions as well as my partners. Now we're going to get into questions from the chat and pre-submitted. So this one person in the chat kind of said, uh, said, what level of degree do you need to get a job as a biochemist? Um, at the very base, I will say a bachelor's degree. So different companies sort of vary. Um, at my company, for instance, we have sort of three main levels. So we have a level of a lab tech um, who are most likely with a bachelor's degree Sometimes they're just kind of right out of college. They don't necessarily have job experience. Um, and so we kind of, we take that as a chance to, to teach a blank slate, right? If you don't have experience, I'm gonna train you from the ground up and I'm gonna teach you exactly what I want you to know. Um, and a lot of the work is a tech. Sometimes it can be a little bit repetitive, um, but that by no means um, means it's any less important. You're often supporting most of the main R&D functions at the company. So even though you're doing things that aren't necessarily always the most new or the most exciting, um, it's really important, really foundational work. And a lot of the times from there, you can kind of build up. So if you've 
gain some experience at one company, you might be able to sort of level up and become something like a research associate um, and start working on your own projects. Or what people also do is maybe they take that experience and then they take it to a different company where they find um, a slightly different opportunity. Um, if you were to come in something with a master's, you would most likely come in at a research associate, maybe associate scientist level. Again, it kind of depends on the company um, for the specific title. But in that case, you would be working on your own projects. You would have guidance of someone, um, probably someone like me or with someone with a little bit more experience than me. Um, most likely you would work with your manager or with your group to design the experiments that you're doing. And then eventually, as you gain more experience with that, you would work a little more independently on your own. Um, and then if you're someone coming in at my level uh, with a PhD, I had basically no industry experience. Uh, so again, I was a little bit green, but I came in, I started working on my own projects. And actually this past year I started, um, I now have my own direct report. So I now have my own research associate who I can help I can help him kind of think about the projects that he's working on. And then he can also help me because I'm training him to be able to do some experiments. Um, and then beyond that, you get into things like being a staff scientist or being a manager. Um, and that just kind of depends what you're looking for in your career. Okay, wow, that's cool. All right, um, another question we have is, can you explain a little bit more on biochemistry? Yes. Um, so, in general, the fields of biochemistry, it's very broad because biology is very broad and chemistry is very broad. Um, I will say that for me specifically, um, an example of a biochemistry project from my, um, from my grad school thesis, um, who here, I don't know, has anyone heard of CRISPR? Oh, I've actually heard of CRISPR before. <laughs> um, so CRISPR is a really great example of um, a pretty prime biochemical system. And if you haven't heard about it, it's, um, it's a system that was derived from a bacteria. So several scientists um, found this system that was originally used as bacterial immunity. So any little bacteria inherently has this system that already worked this way. Um, and they were able to isolate all these different components um, for example, one type of the system is one protein, one RNA, one DNA. And a lot has been done about how all of these molecules interact with each other. And once you understand fundamentally how it works, the fun part begins because you get to start changing little things about it and making it work the way that you want to work and making it work to your advantage. Um, so truly biochemistry is the study of biological molecules with a perspective of chemistry. So if you're looking more at the, um, the pure chemical reactions that are taking place in the context of a system that is relevant to biology. Um, so a lot of you are probably taking some general science classes. Maybe you have a little bit of biology, a little bit of chemistry. Um, as you advance in your career, if you choose to pursue science, what you'll realize is things are just getting more and more and more specific. Um, so you're looking, rather than looking at an entire class of animals, maybe you're looking at um, one subspecies. Uh, maybe instead of looking at one subspecies, you're looking at one type of protein or one type of DNA system. Um, and for me, that's what's really cool because you get to get down to a very specific level. Um, that really doesn't appeal to some people, which is totally fine. That probably just means that you should find something else that interests you that much. Um, so yeah, overall, uh, biochemistry is looking at different types of biological molecules, but you're looking at the reactions that they participate in, um, and you're looking at the possible consequences that they have, and you're looking at the possible ways that those systems can help you, can help your research, can help medicine or therapeutics or diagnostics or any other types of fields like that. Yeah, and someone from the chat kind of had a question like that just bounces right off what you just said. Uh, where would a biochemist work, medical, industrial, or other, or all of the above? Uh, what are some companies that are based on biochemists? Um, so an example that's been in the news a lot, especially this year, is Gilead. Um, so if anybody's heard of Gilead, they are a biopharmaceutical sciences company, and that is a big fat mouthful. But really what it means is the goal of the company way back when they started was to make drugs, right? 
Um, but they didn't want to just make drugs the same way everyone else is doing it. So the reason that they call themselves a biopharmaceutical sciences company is because they want to focus on the biology. They want to make sure that they're not just trying random things to see if they work. They have a really, really rigorous process to characterize drugs and characterize how they might work. Um, and one of the reasons that they kept sciences in their um, title is because they wanted to make sure that all their research stayed focused on the science and not just whatever application. So it's all very um, foundational. Um, in the Bay Area, there are a ton of biotech companies. So some of you um, have probably heard of Silicon Valley. Um, there's also now in Southern California, apparently there's Silicon Beach. So around Venice Beach, there's a lot of little biotech companies that are popping up as well. Um, there are any, any size of company can either be a company of biochemists or rely on biochemists. Um, like I said, my company, we have a ton of engineers, we have a ton of software people. Um, and part of the reason that this works to our advantage is because in order to do something like create one whole product, you need more than just a team of biochemists. You need biochemists, you need engineers, you need electrical people, you need commercial people because you eventually have to sell this thing to people and try to make money. Um, so there are many, many different companies that would involve a career in biochemistry. Um, biotech is definitely obviously a big, um, a big field for that. Uh, therapeutics and pharmaceuticals or diagnostics, um, or even any of the large sort of industrial companies like Thermo Fisher. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of them. If you ever do take a lab class and you look around at a lot of the brand names on any of the packages, you'll probably see things like Thermo Fisher or Agilent or BioRad. Um, so all of these supplies that we, that we need for our everyday experiments that we don't necessarily think twice about, someone still has to develop those and make those and test them and innovate new ways to make those better. Um, so even if you're not doing the pure research on the therapeutic itself, there are many processes both upstream and downstream that um, that require people with this type of expertise as well. Yeah, a, a cool connection is that one of our speakers tomorrow actually works at Thermo Fisher. So that's something for you guys to look forward to. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, another question in the chat is how many years do you have to study to become a biochemist? Oh, goodness gracious. So it depends on, again, it depends a bit on the path you take. For me, so I went through high school, I went through college. How many years is that? 16 years? It's a lot of years. And then I went to grad school. I took about five and a half, say six years to finish my program. So that's 22 years of school. So it's a lot of time. Um, so one thing I'll definitely say is if you think that you're interested in going to grad school, either getting a master's, which is usually two or three years, or getting a PhD, which depending on the program, probably about five to six years, um, you want to make sure that it's really something you want to do. Because I'll tell you what, if you are not interested in the things you're studying, it's not going to be any fun. Um, and your time is worth more than that. So you should definitely find something that interests you. Um, but I will also say that I think it is worth every day and month and year of work that I put into it because I really enjoy what I'm doing now. And that was one of my goals. I wanted to have a job that was doing something I thought was cool and that could be helpful. Uh, but more than that, I wanted to I wanted to find myself somewhere where I could wake up every morning and actually be excited to go to work. Uh, not, maybe not every single morning, but largely you want to be excited about the thing that you're doing because this is going to be something you're working on for the rest of your life. So um, it is many years, sometimes, depending on the path that you take. Um, but if it's something that you're really passionate about and that you're really excited about, it is worth it, I think. All right. So for, uh, so, so going back to the PhD program uh, you took, was that like uh, really difficult or time consuming or like tedious? Um, yes, truly. Um, it was also really enjoyable. So every graduate program will be slightly different. Um, it just depends on the university or the department or the way that the program is run. Um, for me, the way that our program worked was for the first about two years, 
you are doing some research, but most of your focus is on classes. So it is still technically school. You do still have to technically take classes. Um, and the cool thing about that is the way that the transition from high school to college got a little more specific. So I took more science courses in college than I did in high school. Um, when I got to graduate school, things got even more specific. So rather than just taking one class called biochemistry, for example, I got to take a class called biophysics of the cell. So I had a whole class, I had a whole semester just learning about the biophysics of different properties about a single type of cell. Um, and because that was something that I found really cool, it was very exciting. Um, but it's definitely a lot of hard work. Um, and I don't know, there, there are days that maybe I didn't enjoy because I was in the lab until really late at night. Um, but then there are also days when the paper that you write that you submit to a journal gets accepted and that kind of makes up for it. Um, so, you know, I'm not gonna say that every day is rainbows and sprinkles and, and all of that, um, but ultimately because it's something that you really enjoy, it is worth it, but it is definitely hard work. So don't, don't trick yourself into thinking that it's not, at least for me, it was. Maybe if you're even smarter than I am, it won't be as much hard work. So another question from the chat, uh, to work in biochemistry, do you have to learn the other parts of science like physics or genetics? Um, to some extent, yes. Um, I will say that you, if you're truly a biochemist, um, most likely the foundation of biochemistry is going to be the strongest, right? You're going to know that pretty much inside it out, um, specifically the system that you're working on or the project that you're working on. Um, but another thing that you'll find, especially as you, if you go through a graduate program or as you work with other colleagues who are really talented in other backgrounds, you will learn more. Um, so I'm not an expert in physics at all, not even a little bit, but I know more about it than someone who doesn't know anything about science. Because one thing that you'll find as you continue to study with science is that everything is interrelated. So for example, I'm a biochemist. I'm not strictly a biologist, I'm not strictly a chemist. Um, I also, the professor that I uh, went to grad school with is a biophysicist. So I have a little bit of biology, a little bit of physics, a little bit of chemistry. Um, so one thing that you'll learn is once you're outside of a, a textbook, if you're looking at a real world problem, you can't only think about biology or only think about chemistry or physics. You have to think about all of them together. Um, so the further along you get in your education, your focus will narrow. You'll, you'll end up focusing on, on one thing a little more than others, um, but that doesn't mean that you forget about everything else. Okay. Um, another question from the chat is, what type of questions do you get asked or ask and how do you solve those? Oh, so many questions. Um, for example, so one of the systems that we were working on, um, we have one particle of DNA attached to one other particle, which we take that, there's a whole bunch of them in solution um, in probably less than one milliliter. So we're talking like kind of a big fat drop of water. So it's not a lot of volume, uh, but if you're looking on the scale of a single molecule of DNA, there could be millions of molecules of DNA in that big drop of water. Um, so one of our platforms is taking that volume of sample, putting it onto a chip, putting it into our instrument and running it. Great. It worked well. It's working well in other people's labs. One of our big, um, big focuses this past year has been uh, removing that other particle. So rather than having DNA attached to a particle attached to um, our chip, we now have DNA directly attached to our chip. Um, so that was, it's obviously a very large question um, and it involved all of the engineers and all of the chemists and all of the biochemists and um, everyone's innovation to be able to take our system that was working one way, basically be able to move, remove one fundamental piece of it and still have it work just as well. Um, so that's one of the big picture questions. Another example of sort of an everyday thing that I encounter is how do I make this work better. So how do I make the accuracy higher or how do I make the runtime shorter? Everyone's impatient. Everyone wants results faster. Um, or how do I make things cost less? That's something that I never really considered until I started working at a company. Because in academia, 
we're not worried about what things cost. We just want to know what's happening. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, problems that you might encounter. Awesome. Okay, so we got uh, another question. What is DNA sequencing? I have never learned this. Right. Um, so DNA sequencing, if you've ever, um, if anyone has ever watched CSI or probably even listened to the news recently, uh, we all know that our whole bodies are, um, are made up of DNA. Even animals, even plants, everything has DNA. Um, so DNA sequencing is the process of taking um, a sample. So it could be a little bit of blood, for example. Um, it could be um, some cells from the inside of your mouth on a little cotton ball, a little cheek swab. Um, and so what we do is we take the DNA that's in all of our cells and we take that DNA. And what I want to know is what is the sequence of that DNA? So DNA is made up of four different components. We have A, C, G, T. Um, so if you've, I don't know what level of um, science everybody's at, but if you consider all of those different building blocks, basically what we've done is we've built a machine that I can feed in this little sample with a sequence that's very, very, very long. And I can tell you exactly what the sequence is of that whole um, chain of DNA. And so this can be used for a couple different things. Um, one of the more commonly uh, known applications is forensics. Um, so this says, okay, my blood was found at a crime scene somewhere. If I sequence my blood and know the, uh, the sequence of the DNA matches what was found at the crime scene, I might be in trouble, right? If it's not, then maybe I'm rolled out and they can move on to something else. Um, so forensics is a field that has been growing a lot in the past several years, um, in part because technology has gotten a lot better. Um, I think also in part because it's become more popular. So people are very interested because they're seeing it on TV and realizing, oh, I can make a career out of this and I can really do this. So that's pretty cool. Um, another big application of DNA sequencing is targeted genes. So for instance, with breast cancer, there is one gene that many, many scientists have determined is associated with breast cancer. And that particular gene has a particular sequence. So if, it, if I can take your DNA or a patient's DNA and sequence that entire genome, and if I can find this particular gene that's associated with breast cancer, that can help me with diagnostics. It can help me with different therapeutics. Um, so those, those are just two examples of many, many different ways that um, DNA sequencing can be used. The way that it works is a little bit complicated, but I'll sort of, uh, I'll break it down a little simply. So if you have um, a chain of DNA that's very, very, very long, what we do is we, um, we have that DNA sample, you have an enzyme or a little protein, which does a function. Um, and the function is that it builds DNA. So what it does is it reads your, your template strand of DNA. And if you give it enough building blocks or the actual nucleotides, the A, C, T, G that make up the DNA, when you put all of those together, the protein attaches onto the DNA sample and it pulls in the correct corresponding nucleotide and it spits that out through a whole bunch of data processing and it gives you this very nice, neat sequence. Um, so that can be used for many different types of applications. All right, so um, going back to sequencing and all of that, someone in the chat asks, how do you find gene sequences? Um, so that requires a lot of specific work in the field of genetics. And so a lot of it, and I'm not an expert in genetics specifically, um, but broadly speaking, a lot of it is finding um, associations between different proteins, uh, different genes, and different conditions, for example. So um, inside of our bodies, we have RNA, part of RNA. It gets transcribed or translated into DNA. Um, the sequence from RNA and DNA then dictates the sequence of the protein. And so a lot of this is um, going basically back and forth along this chain because a protein way downstream could be associated with some disease. So if you're able to find that protein X causes disease X, you can trace it back and say, okay, well, if I know protein X, can I find the DNA sequence associated with protein X? If I can, then that same DNA sequence is associated with disease X, and then you can try to target it. Um, and this whole thing itself is a huge field. So there are many, many people working on things like, um, like gene targeting and gene identification. Okay, 
Um, one of the last questions we have from the chat is what is runtime? Oh, runtime, sorry. So this um, runtime is what we consider the time from when you take your sample and put it into the instrument to the time that the um, instrument is finished and then you have your results. Um, so for example, when I first started working at our company, our total runtime, the time from basically start to finish is, oh, I think it was like 48 hours. So it was like two days. Um, so depending on what you're used to, if you're used to it taking a week to get results, two days isn't so bad. But if you're used to getting results overnight, two days is not so good. Um, so one of the things that you want to focus on is, okay, well, what if I can get my results even faster, but I can't compromise the quality of the results, right? I can't compromise the accuracy. I can't compromise the integrity of the sample. I have to make sure that it's still good. Um, so overall, it's just the, the time from start to finish, from sample to result. Okay. Um, and I think this is the last question from the chat is, is there a specific SAT score you must get to get into the field of biochemistry? Oh my goodness. Um, I think that score requires, so I took the SAT so long ago, I don't even remember what my score was. So that's that for you. Um, I would say that score requirements, grades, things like this, it doesn't let uh, don't let it determine the career path you take, um, but use that as data and maybe work with your guidance counselors um, to help figure out what programs will be best for you. So if you want to study biochemistry, you should study biochemistry. But if you have an SAT score that is not in the range of Harvard, don't focus on Harvard. Focus on something that is realistic that will still give you a good education in your um, in the field that you want to study. Um, so, did I have the best grades in my whole school? No, I'm sure I did not. Did I have the best test scores in my whole school? No, I'm sure I did not. Um, I found a program that I liked, um, but I also got into you, that has to matter, right? Um, and you have to use that as a jumping off point. So definitely work hard, focus on your grades, but know that just because you got a B in this class or maybe a C in this class, that's not necessarily gonna stop you from pursuing something technical or whatever it is that you want to do. Okay, and uh, building off of that, we got two questions that are kind of similar. So do you have to go to a prestigious college to get into biochemistry? And what biochem program did you attend and was it good? Um, so a prestigious school, I, I don't think it's necessary. I think it's more about what you end up learning um, and how you take that with you, right? You can get a job even if you didn't graduate from a really, really fancy school. People do it all the time. Um, I would say it's more about the quality of the education and what you take from it. Um, the programs that I went to, so for my undergrad, for my bachelor's degree, I went to Purdue University, which is in Indiana, which I, some of you might not have even heard of because it's far away. Um, I grew up in Chicago. So for me, Purdue was pretty close. Um, I didn't, well, I applied to some schools that were far away from home. My parents didn't want me to go that far away from home. So I stayed kind of close by. Um, I liked the program. One of the reasons that I chose it was because they had a focus on doing research as an undergrad. Um, and so the research that I did was not very groundbreaking. It didn't save anybody's life, but I thought it was really cool. And it gave me a little bit of experience in something that wasn't just taking classes. Um, and so I worked with some of the graduate students um, on a little bit of computer modeling about different amino acids which make up proteins. Um, and so technically I didn't work on that project anymore after I was done with my, um, uh, my degree, but it was a very cool experience for me to be able to work with um, graduate students and kind of understand what graduate school was because otherwise I don't think that I would have as an undergrad. Um, so that was my bachelor's I did at Purdue. For grad school, I went to the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. Um, and one of the reasons I picked that university, I considered several, um, basically just like anything else, you apply to a bunch of different schools. Sometimes you go tour the campus or you have interviews with different people in the department. Um, one of the reasons that I liked uh, the USC's department was because everything was very collaborative. So a lot of the research that was being done was being done in conjunction with the biology department or the engineering department or the school of pharmacy. 
Um, and again, to me, having all those different perspectives kind of all in the same place, looking at the same problems was very attractive to me. And so that's one of the reasons that I picked it. Um, I was also really excited to move to Los Angeles because Chicago right now is like six degrees. So that was a good move for me as well. All right, so we're approaching the end of our workshop time. So Dr. Nurin, if you have any last words you'd like to tell the audience, uh, that would be the right time. Sure. Um, so firstly, thank you guys for giving up some of your weekend to come listen to what I have to say. That's pretty cool to see you guys all excited about that. Um, another thing I will say is just keep doing this. Even if it's not biochemistry or even if it's not science, find something that really interests you and figure out a way to study it, figure out a way to do it. Um, and if you have any more specific questions, I don't know if I'll be able to answer them all, but I'm I'm glad to do it. You can probably uh, maybe funnel them back through the organizers and they can um, send me if there's any other specific questions. I'm, I'm happy to do what I can to, to answer them. Yeah, we can do that for sure. All right, so thank you for everyone for showing up and thank you, uh, Dr. Narin, for uh, taking time out of your day to make it here. So I think that's going to be it for today's, uh, for this workshop. So stay tuned in the next 15 minutes, we'll have our next workshop and we'll see you all then. Okay, bye. Thank, thank you so you. much. Bye.